the food chain of the mergers and acquisitions ecosystem. We're often asked, how does all of this tie together? How does the actual deal world work in the sense that we have public companies, private companies, small companies, big companies, growing companies, shrinking companies. How does this all fit together? What are the objectives that people are seeking to accomplish? And how does a business work through this food chain over its life, whether it's through the same ownership, different ownership, so how does it all tie together? Now, when we think of the M&A world, when we think of capital, when we think of mergers and acquisitions, we think of a lot of gears, pulleys, and levers as to how the machine, if you will, of the economy works. There's constant consolidation, there's growth, there's new things, there's capitalization, and you have all of these things growing and shrinking all in tandem in this beautiful cacophony of capitalism. And while there are excesses and while there are good, bad, and the ugly that comes along with it. There's been no creation of mankind over the history of humanity that has increased the standard of living more rapidly and to a higher extent than our form of capitalism that has been evolved here. So without getting into any political tangents in that regard, it is worth noting that there is a machine that's taking place. And in today's video, we want to shed a little bit more light on how this works and at least give a framework to understand how the ladder or the food chain functions in a capitalist environment. And so we want to talk about four key elements of the economic food chain that we're going to work with. And the first is the enterprise spectrum. And so what we mean by this is on one end of the spectrum, you have large publicly traded companies. On the other end of the spectrum, you have solo entrepreneurs running a small business. You say, how do these things ultimately connect? So think of it as a ladder. So you have the giant publicly traded companies, and then moving down the ladder, you have smaller publicly held companies, you have large privately held companies, smaller privately held companies. Continuing, and there's a lot of overlap and then diagrams amongst this, but just to give you a visualization, you have private equity firms that have large portfolio companies, you have middle market private equity firms with portfolio companies, you have smaller private equity firms that do not have portfolio companies relative to whatever the subject company is that we're discussing. You have family offices, independent sponsors, search funds, high net worth individuals, and it, there's a lot more granularity along that. However, what you can see is it starts from these smaller, again, entrepreneurs, investors, families, people with ideas. It all starts at the individual level and then slowly it evolves over time do large publicly traded companies. And so as much as we think of some of these gigantic companies of DuPont or Walmart or McDonald's, they all started with individual ideas and entrepreneurs. And so that should be very encouraging in many ways, but the question remains is how does it all connect? And so at least to give you the visualization of that enterprise spectrum to start with. So next, we want to talk about the steps of criteria. And so if you think Every business along that food chain, and whether they are specifically businesses looking to acquire businesses such as private equity or they're large strategic companies, they all are taking on capital to either start new ideas or utilizing capital to buy other businesses. And so you can think of each step along the way as someone that makes money and someone that deploys capital. And every step along the way has their specified criteria of what they would deploy capital into, whether it's a new idea or whether it's a business they would buy. As you can imagine, individual entrepreneurs may not have lots of capital, and so their criteria could be, we want a great idea, but that's not as capital intensive from the front end. Moving up the chain, you may have the private equity firms that think we can be nimble and innovative, but at the same time, we do have the capital. If the smaller individual might say, I'll buy a company that makes up to $2 million a year in profit, the private equity firm, depending on what size and where they are in the strata, could buy companies that make $5 million a year in profit. They could buy companies that make $50 million a year in profit. And then, when you really get up the food chain, you start to reach certain territories of companies that can buy businesses or have criteria that are larger than any private equity firm. A good-sized private equity firm may manage a couple billion dollars. Berkshire Hathaway wouldn't make an acquisition unless it was at least a couple billion dollars. So the whole size of the whole private equity firm. So you can imagine for every size step along the way or that enterprise spectrum that we discussed comes a criteria jump along the way as well. And so keep this in mind. Businesses tend to find their way up this food chain. We'll give a more specific example as we evolve this thought. And so the third concept is the steps of multiples. And so it tends to be, we've discussed it in other videos about multiples of businesses and multiples expansion, that each step along the way is looking to deploy larger amounts of capital and therefore is looking for more established companies and can pay more for those companies. And so if a business is making a million dollars a year, perhaps it sells for four to seven times that. Again, if it's making $3 million a year, it could be five to eight times that. If it's making $5 million a year, it could be 
six to 12 times, and on and on and on. Obviously, it's very specific to the particular example. However, it's a concept to keep in mind that the multiples expand. So as you're growing, there's the spectrum of size, there's a spectrum of criteria, there's a spectrum of multiples being paid. So you can see things as they move up are larger and more expensive. So the fourth concept that ties this together is the cost of capital. So if you are an individual who is taking the money out of your own pocket to buy something, the cost of capital is significant. If you lose it, you won't eat. Very simple. Whatever you want to attribute that to a percentage or an interest rate, you can do it, but starvation is a good motivator. And think of it on that end of the spectrum. Now, moving up the food chain, private equity firms have traditionally underwritten deals towards a 20% return, meaning they need a 20% annual return on the capital that they deploy into situations. Moving into publicly traded companies, Remember, the long-term return on the S&P 500 is about 7% to 8% over the last 100 years or so. And so the cost of capital, their ability to raise money, if they were to say to prospective investors, think of when a company issues stocks, they're basically telling the investors, we believe we're going to get this type of return on your capital, therefore give us your capital instead of putting it into something else. So if it's at 7 to 8%, that's effectively their cost of capital because that would be how much they would have to pay the market, if you will, to or the return that they would need to generate in the market to warrant the capital. And we've talked about it in older videos that that return on capital needs to exceed the risk-free rate or the treasury bond rate. But for example purposes here, let's think about the spectrum in very, very high level terms. The individual wants to buy a company if the equity, the cost of capital there is not eating. The, <laughs> the private equity firm is going to underwrite a deal on the smaller side of deals on the smaller side of private equity to maybe 25% a year to the larger private equity firms that might be underwriting to 12 to 15%, then moving into the public markets, they're underwriting deals to 7 or 8%. So what that implies is that as the cost of capital gets lower because they are bigger, they can, following through our other prongs that we've already talked about, pay more for companies in the increase of multiple, yet have to look for larger situations to deploy more capital into, which makes the increase of the steps of criteria. And so, tying this all back to an example, let's say someone runs a widget distribution company. They buy lots of widgets, they sell them to all different people for all different applications, and they do some special magic in between that makes these the most wonderful widgets in the world. Now, their company makes a million to two million dollars a year in profit. An excellent business, all time and cheap aside. Very durable business. Again, fundamentals, access, capabilities, all strong. Now, a private equity firm says this is a wonderful company. The owner's been doing it for 50 years, wants to retire. Private equity firm buys the widget distribution company as a platform for future expansion. It then travels the world finding other widget distributors that deal with adjacent or similar audiences and starts acquiring those distribution companies and bolting them on or adding them on to the original wonderful widget distribution company. And so that aggregation is then sold to a much larger private equity firm that perhaps already owns or wants to buy manufacturing companies. And so why buy widgets from somebody else if we can manufacture them ourselves? So now they're in the business of vertically integrating, of manufacturing the widgets, distributing the widgets and selling them. And they're able to then traverse the world and buy larger organizations that do both of these things. And then ultimately, when the larger private equity sells it, maybe they sell it to another private equity firm for another five to seven years, but ultimately it will find its way to the public market if all goes well, where there's an initial public offering. And now the public, and whether it's pensions, endowments, or individuals, own the widget company. And now it has oversight of the public company. It has the capabilities of a public company to grow, to do other initiatives, to grow globally, and get even bigger. So all of this started with one individual who figured out something that an audience wanted, how to tweak something in a way that made it defensible and durable and effective at solving the pain point for its clients. And it moves through that food chain of selling to private equity, selling to another private equity, ultimately finding its way to the public markets, and ultimately being owned as a public entity. And so that is the way the economy 
largely works. Now in every industry, it happens at different cadences. There's upstarts that come in that disrupt things. There's a lot of creation and disruption along the way. However, that is how the machine works. That is how the food chain with mergers and acquisitions work. And that's effectively how the capitalist ecosystem works. So if you could take one conclusion from this, however, if one is in the position of looking to sell their business, what should the goal be? We've talked about in many of our videos, what are the different things that differentiate good buyers from bad buyers. But from a purely economic perspective, the idea should be the further you can leapfrog the process, the further you can leapfrog the food chain, then the lower the cost of capital will be for the acquirer, and therefore the higher the price that they can pay for something. Now, there's obviously a lot of other variables that go into a transaction that make it good or bad, that make it desirable or undesirable, but the fundamental framework of an economic food chain, if you will, is this. So if you're an individual that owns a business, you want to see just how far up the food chain you can sell the business into. If it's private equity owned, they're looking at who's the biggest person that we can sell it to. The bigger's not always better. However, it's directionally indicative in the way you should be looking at something. How do we sell this to a more capitalized party with a lower cost of capital that can pay more for something or for the other two as well? So that's our thought for today. Hopefully it continues to go well for everyone. Keep pushing forward. God bless. See you next time.